2 Corinthians 12. God's grace. 2 Corinthians 12. I uh, tweeted something, what was it, Friday or Saturday, about seeing an article in the pa- in, on the internet. Who reads, a, I don't read a paper, article in the paper. Who reads the paper anymore? I don't. Um, do what? Yeah, uh, only if you print it out. But um, I, I did, I went, I cannot believe this. When, when God gives us these details in the Bible of what is going to happen, and then you see, you start to get the idea of how it's going to happen, you're just going, I can't believe, I can't believe this. And it's, we're almost living in a time now because of the technology, we're almost living in what people would call magical times. Because... There are things that are being done now that borderline magic. By that I mean supernatural things happening. Um, Just in the last couple months, you may have noticed if you use Gmail, you may have noticed that Gmail is getting a little bit better every day at picking out the next four or five words that you're going to write. Okay? And it's, it's because Google spent all this money and time learning you. Not just learning humans, but learning you. Knowing how... It used to be, used to be funny when Brady and Bradley Crumb both went here, I noticed that because they were twins, they have identical DNA, their brains worked almost exactly alike, they would finish each other's sentences. Some people would say that's the psychic connection. No, it's just, I think their brain was designed exactly the same way by the same DNA, and they both grew up together, meaning that they shared most of their experiences together, and that's what determines how we speak. And they would, one would start talking, the other would finish the sentence. Well, Google now is your twin. Your new wife or husband that can finish your sentences for you. And thinks that we, for some reason, need our sentences finished by somebody else. And, but that's just, that's the times we live in. And I am going, I'm going to make you wait till Tuesday to find out what it was. But it just, I was, as I was looking at it, I, I was going, I can't, believe what I'm, I can't believe what I'm reading. It was just that unreal. So, um, you know, some say that the coming of the Lord is years away. Some say that it could happen any day, and it can. Uh, but for anybody who's thinking that we're not there yet, there could be something happen tomorrow that would accelerate things in a matter of, it could, hap- it, it could happen any day. So be ready for it. 2 Corinthians 12. Aren't you glad you're saved? Amen? So uh, the Apostle Paul says, uh, Concerning his thorn, that in verse 8, For this thing I besought the Lord thrice, that it might depart from me. And he said unto me, My grace is sufficient for thee, for my strength is made perfect in weakness. Most gladly, therefore, will I rather glory in my infirmities that the power of Christ may rest upon me. Therefore, I take pleasure in infirmities, in reproaches, in necessities, in persecutions, in distresses, for Christ's sake, for when I am weak, then am I strong. And uh, the week before, I had to go back and look at my Sunday school lesson a week before last because I couldn't remember. I'm going, what did I preach on last Sunday? And I'm going, nothing. So, um, but two Sundays ago, we were defining what grace was, and we got to Romans chapter 3, um, so if you're there, uh, go to like Romans 4, because we're going to touch on that next, but Romans 3 is where Paul said in verse 24, being justified freely by His grace, 
That idea of free and grace always goes together. If you say one, you say the other. If it's free, then it's of grace. If it's not free, then it's not grace. Someone is making a demand out of you if they say, well, I'm going to have grace on you and give this to you, but I expect something back. That's not grace. They, they're giving you something, but it's not really a gift because there's an expectation that you're going to return something back to them somehow, some way. And then in that sense, it is absolutely not free. If it costs something, it's not free. If it costs a penny, it's not free. It still costs something. And so whether grace is free or not, just the very definition of grace means that it's absolutely free of charge, free of performance. All it requires is faith. And um, I'm going to preach the message that I would have preached last Sunday. I'm preaching today. Um, because of something that happened with someone that I know, some of you may know him, uh, but if he were here, he would preach it better than me, because he knows about it. But it has to do with salvation, and you know, you always get into the quarrel of, can you lose your salvation, or once you are saved, does that mean that you never lose salvation and then you can what if you go out and do all of this stuff are you still saved what if you become an atheist what if you become my favorite expression is an atheist lesbian witch because that's like the exact opposite of what a born-again Christian is supposed to be and God does preserve saints but there is there is a I will say a qualification of man for receiving that preservation. That man believes God. God keeps him believing. Okay? He keeps him believing. Who knows somebody that may have at one time said, I believe in God and Jesus Christ and all that stuff, and now... You just know that they don't and don't care to and unless God intervenes are probably not ever going to again. Who knows somebody like that? Okay? There are people like that. The Bible says judge no man before the time and I understand that. But when I, when I say God's grace is free and that he requires faith, I don't believe that faith is just I believed one day and I don't have to believe ever again. I think the Bible is very clear that they continue in that belief. They continue in that. God, that's the seal of the living God in them. God seals them and they stay faithful. They stay that way. So, um, Romans 4 is where I want to go to next in, in defining grace and to make sure that we understand that grace coupled with faith still, and I've even had some people say, well, faith is a work. No, it's not. It's the, it's the, it is, God says it's not. And he says that in Romans 4. Verse 4, Now to him that worketh, is the reward not reckoned of grace, but of debt. And what he means by that is, if you choose, you've got two covenants. You've got this Mount Sinai old covenant. You've got this new covenant now that says, believe that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. If you believe in Christ, trust in him, that's the new covenant. The old covenant was, if you're going to keep the law, then keep the law but you're in, you are required to keep every portion of the law, every bit of it. And you can't just pick and choose the ones you want to keep and say, well, I, I don't have to because God will still have grace on me. If you're going to choose a covenant, choose a, con a covenant. And it's either going to be the covenant of works or the covenant of grace. But if you're going to choose the covenant of works, the Ten Commandments, then do all ten of those, and don't you dare fail in one of them. 
Because with God, it's an exclusive issue. It's either all or it's nothing. You cannot be partially obedient to God and say, I'm obedient to God. Does that make sense to everybody? And God did that for a reason. God did that to exclude boasting. Because you show me a religion of works, and I promise you they'll boast of what they do over everybody else that they say doesn't do what they do. And it doesn't matter what it is. If it's the church of Christ, the church of Christ says, you must be baptized in our water or you're not saved. And they boast of that over, they think they're the only ones who are going to heaven because they were baptized in their church, period, the end. And they are very exclusive in that. And they boast of what they do over everybody else in the whole world who says they're a Christian. And it doesn't matter if it's Church of Christ or the Roman Catholic Mass or the Hebrew Roots uh, Sabbath Keepers or, or whatever it is, they always boast on what they do. And God eliminates boasting out of our salvation. He makes sure that we understand it's not now, nor will it ever be about what you do. It's always going to be about what Christ did. Always. So he says in verse 16, Romans 4, Therefore it is of faith that it might be by grace. There it is. It is of faith that it might be by grace. Here God, once again, has coupled faith and grace together showing you that faith is not a work. Faith is not an action. Faith is not you keeping the law. Faith is you trust in God. To the end, the promise might be sure to all the seed, not to that only which is of the law. Talking about the Jews, the Jews are the recipients of the law. They had the oracles of God. They got the Ten Commandments. Us Gentiles didn't, so... Not to that only which is of the law, but to that also which is of the faith of Abraham, who is the father of us all. And you, when you read New Testament doctrine, God does this thing about a timing. Because if you notice, in, if you go to Genesis 12, God gave Abraham the promise before he was even Abraham. He gave him the promise. And... He said it was going to be by grace. It's going to be by Abraham's or Abram's faith. He made this promise to him. And then, I mean, the covenant that he made with Abraham was even before the law of Mount Sinai. So how could it be of law keeping when Abram received of it or Abraham received of it? How can it be by law keeping? Because Abraham was a recipient of God's grace even before the law of Mount Sinai. And in the New Testament, the Bible makes that very plain. How can Abram, who was under a covenant with God 400 years before Sinai, how can he then be required to keep the law when the law wasn't even given in his lifetime? And that's how God puts it. So, grace is always about, as uh, we said it a couple Sundays ago, unmerited grace favor. If you work, you expect pay, correct? If you work, you expect some sort of benefit or payback. So, if your salvation then is about works, then you think with God that God owes you something. And I'll throw in here the Charismatic word faith movement. I think I brought this up two Sundays ago, but that's their idea, is that they call themselves obedient, therefore the richest of them and the wealthiest of them go around telling everybody else, you're not wealthy like we are because you're not doing enough or you're not earning it. We earned it. We deserved it. So God had to make us rich because of what we did. And I just don't buy that stuff at all. Turn to Romans 11. Romans 11. Paul's going to illustrate it even further. One of my favorite classes in Bible college 
was a course on the book of Romans. It's because there was no tests. No tests. The whole course was a series of about four or five term papers. And I was pretty good at writing a term paper. Okay? So I did better in that class than I did asking me questions. Okay? And, um, but the study of the book of Romans is a study of what grace is really is. So verse, Romans 11, verse 4, But what saith the answer of God unto him? I have reserved myself 7,000 men who have not bowed the knee to the image of Baal. Even so then, at this present time, also there is a remnant according to the election of grace. Now let's study these 7,000 men for a minute. God obviously, this is in the days of Elijah, because Elijah is complaining uh, after his showdown with the prophets of Baal, and um, Jezebel says, I'm going to kill him. So Elijah runs off and asks God to take his life. Okay, God, I did what you asked, and there's nobody faithful, there's nobody, there's nobody going to serve you, there's nobody going to worship you, so God, what am I here for? Just take me out. And God says, Elijah, you don't know what I know. Uh, you've actually done some good, but you don't know what I know. I've got 7,000 people that you don't know about that I have reserved that have not bowed the knee to the image of Baal. Now here's what I see in salvation. Is it more of how can I say this? Out of the two issues of preservation or perseverance, preservation is God keeping you saved, keeping you right. Perseverance is us determining in our hearts we don't want any other religion, we don't want any other way, we don't want to fall back. We want to continue to serve God the rest of our lives. Raise your hand if that's you. You want to do that. Okay? But where did that desire come from? Did God not put that in you? I believe He did. So is it preservation or perseverance? They're not exclusive. They don't hate each other. I think that it is both. Because when God says, I've reserved to myself 7,000 men, He didn't just say, I've got 7,000 that I'm going to pick and I'm going I'm to bring them into heaven. He said, I've reserved to me 7,000 men that have not bowed the knee to the image of Baal. In other words, they never, they're not going to choose Baal. They didn't choose Baal. And I'm not going to let them choose Baal. Does that make sense? When God keeps someone saved, He keeps them right. Do you believe that? That's what I believe. God keeps them right. Because I have, I mean, I've, when you look at the condition of churchianity in this country right now, the way the churches have gone off into gross apostasy, as far as their morality is concerned, not just sinning, but condoning the sins, that's when you have a problem. As far as I think God is concerned. All this talk about, well, they don't lose their salvation. All this talk about that, I don't, I don't see that as being right. Because those whom God saves, He keeps right. He keeps them, and I'm going to preach on that this morning. He keeps them right. So, verse 5 even so then at this present time also there is a remnant according to the election of what? Grace. You're still in church. But by how? But by grace. God kept you. Now, He may have brought you to a point to where you said, God, I'm, I'm uh, surrendering to you another aspect of my life because I can't take what this sin is doing to me. And that truly was your choice. That was your wanting to stay in right with God. 
But there again, what, what did God do to you to get you there? Did God let you just enjoy all the pleasures of sin without any consequences at all? Absolutely not. God took you as a child and whooped you and chastised you and made you right. That's what He does. And that's what He's done here. There's a, there's a remnant. Election means that God already knew who those 7,000 were going to be. But that election was by His grace. And verse 6, if by grace, then it is no more works. So it's not grace and works. It never was and it never will be. If it by grace, it is no more of works. Otherwise, grace is no more grace. But if it be of works, then it is no more grace. Otherwise, work is no more work. Which, in other words, pick one. How many masters can you serve? Can't serve two. You can't serve two masters, and you can't, you can't join two exclusive contracts. You can't do it. In, who remembers um, when Howard Hughes died? You remember when Howard Hughes died? Okay. How many people came out of the woodwork saying, he promised me his billion dollars. The courts had to sit and figure out who was the rightful heir of Howard Hughes's fortune. Because the guy went nuts toward the end of his life. Okay, and he made, apparently made a promise to some guy, I'll cut you in my inheritance or whatever. And the courts had to sell that out. In other words, you can't have two people showing up at the same time saying, I'm the exclusive heir to Howard Hughes's fortune. You can't do it. It's like, it's like you can't have two firstborn sons. You can't. Even when Rachel had the twins in her, one of them was first. Always. You cannot have two firstborn sons. So you cannot have grace and works or works and grace. You cannot mix the two. It's going to be one or the other. You cannot have well-lit darkness. Can't do it. Okay? Um, you can't have dry water. Huh? Powdered water. What do you add? For powdered water, what do you add? Okay? You can't, ha you can't have these things. You cannot have works. Added to grace. And if people, listen to me now, if people are saved by grace, then we can't go and make them do things in order for us to say they're saved. This is why God leaves salvation out of the church, saying you're saved, you're not saved. It's not our place to say that to anybody. That's God's place and only God's place. Amen? So, Acts chapter 15, the Early church, the disciples, the elders, they had, they, had, they had to tackle this issue. Because early on in the church, there was, it was mainly Jews being saved. It was mainly Jews becoming believers in Jesus Christ. But as Gentiles began to be saved... And then they received the Holy Spirit and the evidence of the, the gifts of the Spirit and so on was coming upon them. Then there came up this question. If the Gentiles who say they believe in Jesus Christ and they received the Holy Spirit just like we did at Pentecost, if they received those gifts of God and none of them were circumcised, how can we say that in order to be saved, they must keep the law, at least one law of circumcision. Because if you keep one law, you've got to keep all of them. And these guys knew that. Those Jews. Paul, Paul was no stooge when it came to the law. Neither was James. Neither, neither was Peter. These men were Jews, lifelong Jews. They knew about law keeping. 
And they knew the Jews' dirty little secret of law keeping, and that is, we never kept the law. Not the way God required it. So, in Acts chapter 15, verse 6, the apostles and elders came together for to consider this matter. And when there had been much disputing, as there always will be amongst Christians, over practically anything, I mean, that's, I mean, that's who we are. We, we argue things about the Bible, okay? How you do it, I think, reflects who you really are. But there are people who don't agree with everything that I say, probably sitting here, probably watching online. Uh, but my liver doesn't always see things the way my left lung does, but they're members of my body. And they're all recipients of the same blood and the same DNA, and Jesus loves them all. Amen? So, when they had been much disputing, Peter rose up and said unto them, Men and brethren, ye know how that a good while ago God made choice among us that the Gentiles, by my mouth, should hear the word of the gospel and believe. And, and Peter's referencing uh, Acts chapter 10 when he received a vision from God about going to a Gentile's house, Cornelius. Cornelius received a vision from God about God sending someone over to bring him salvation. And those two came together. Cornelius was a Gentile. He was saved. His house was saved. Peter preached the gospel, death, burial, resurrection of Jesus Christ. And it was by grace. And Cornelius and his house got saved. And the Holy Ghost fell upon them. They began to speak in tongues. Peter was an eyewitness to this. He, so Peter was at Pentecost when those Jews received the Holy Ghost and spoke in tongues. And Peter was at Cornelius' house when the Gentiles, same thing. And so he said that the Gentiles by my mouth should hear the word of the gospel and believe. Verse 8, And God, which knoweth the hearts, bear them witness, giving them the Holy Ghost, even as he did unto us, and put no difference, put no difference between us and them, purifying their hearts by faith. You want God to clean your heart out, right? Trust him. Trust his word. He will. And... So there's no difference between Jew or Gentile and how they're saved. Now therefore, why tempt ye God to put a yoke upon the neck of the disciples, which neither our fathers nor we were able to bear? Meaning the law, keeping the law. We weren't able to bear this yoke of law keeping. Yeah, we got circumcised, but we, had, we committed adultery, we murdered, we lied, we stole, we coveted, we broke the Sabbath by our traditions. So we, we say we keep the law, but we don't. We broke the law. So why should we make the Gentiles do it when we didn't do it? And that was the point. So verse 11, But we believe that through the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ, we shall be saved even as they. It's by grace. Now, I'm still one of these. I think men ought to have short hair and women ought to have long hair and a man ought to look like a man, a woman ought to look like a woman. And I believe two people ought to get married before they start a family, not after. I, I mean, that's old-fashioned ideas, right? But I've seen long-haired guys get saved, and then God purified their heart. God cleaned up their life. I didn't have to. And God had saved them before they got a haircut. God saved them before things happened or before God made changes in their life. And I was thinking this the other day, you know how we, you know how we look at people and we judge them on their appearance and things like that. And the Holy Ghost was having me look at people and say, Mike, the thing is, if I save them, I change their life. So don't demand that somebody change their life so they can get saved. Don't worry. And I would say to anybody who you want salvation, you don't want to die and go to hell, but you don't know that you can change your life or that you want to change your life or whatever. I say to you, 
Trust God and let God make the changes that He wants to make in you. Does that sound about right to everybody? Because I know in all the years that I've been in this church building, God's had a lot of patience with me. A lot of patience. And little by little, God makes those changes in us that, he, that please Him. And it's about us pleasing God, not us pleasing one another. Okay, get God's people to say amen. Now, Acts chapter 20. Here's what I like. Paul is, in Acts 20, Paul is in Rome and he is a prisoner. And he knows that he is going to depart soon. He's going to leave Rome. What's his next stop? Jerusalem above. And so Paul realizes that he needs to leave his legacy behind to them. What is his legacy? In verse 32, Now, brethren, I commend you to God and to the word of his grace. What is he commending them to? The Bible. Which is able to build you up and to give you an inheritance among all them which are sanctified. So it is God's grace. How do you like yourself now that you're saved? Do you like yourself better now that you're saved than you did before? Are you a better person now? Okay. And you are. You are a better person. But who did that? God did that. The word of God's grace built you up. It makes the changes in you that God wants to make. Okay? I, I, I could use, again, the illustration of the body. That a child conceived in his mother's womb, early on, every cell of his body looks exactly identical to the other. And if you look... In the book of Acts, that's what you see. Because remember, early on in the book of Acts, they had all things common, didn't they? They all looked alike. They all were exactly identical to each other. But then, as time goes on, one of those cells, when it divides and makes a new cell, that new cell is different than the rest of them. Now, here's what happens when somebody becomes different than we. What do we kind of do? Right? And it's normal. We kind of step away from them a little bit. And they step away from us. Children, we want our children to be just like us, for better or worse. But as those children grow up and mature, we see then that they take on differences from their mom and dad. It's hard to take, but that's the way of life. So they take on their own differences. And when that cell, that first cell, has moved over from the collective, and now that cell is different than the others, when that cell divides and makes new cells, that cell is going to repeat the change. And those groups of cells now are going to cluster together because they're different than the other ones. But then, simultaneously, some of these other cells that were all identical, they start making some changes of their own, and they start becoming different than the others. This is why my wrist is not attached to my heart. Because my wrist ended up different than my heart because God needed their hand and the wrist to do things that my heart doesn't do. Right? So, just because we don't see it all eye to eye, just because we don't always agree on everything, that's not necessarily bad, not necessarily good. 
it is the way of life. It is the way God designs it because for each and every one of us, God has something unique, something different to do. To be part of something else that God wants done. And it's God who is the one who makes that decision. I mean, what is it that guides every one of these cells into eventually become heart muscle or bone or they become blood vessels or they become brain matter or they become teeth or whatever? What is it that guides every bit of this as, you know, parts of the body, the DNA, the book, the Word of God? That's what makes each one of us the way we are. Paul, what did Paul say? By God's grace, I am what I am. And he couldn't be any different than the way he ended up because that's how God made him. Heavenly Father, we ask for more of your grace every day. I pray, dear God, that you would guide and bless the word of your grace as it goes into the hearts and the lives of these people. Father, it is not up to me to decide what everybody can do, what everybody should do, what everybody should be, or how they should be. Father, it's up to your word. It's up to your spirit to do that. Father, just supply us, Lord, with the word of your grace. And teach us what it is that we need to know. We ask your blessings now. We pray this in Jesus' name and all of God's people said, Amen. Amen.